Hey guys, welcome to The Remnant Radio. You're watching one of 19 episodes with Dr. Craig Keener, one of the preeminent Bible scholars on the planet, and we're talking about the Gospel of Mark. This is going to be an exciting episode. The connections that Dr. Keener put together while we were with him at Asbury Seminary, phenomenal. But man, it was an expensive trip to get all of us out there to film this content. But we want to give it to you for free. Well, we do want to give it to you for free, but... One of the ways that you can help offset the cost for this is by purchasing our home group material. Dawson, our researcher, has put together this material. There's a leader's guide. There is a participant's guide. So you you watch the video, you read the material, and then we walk you through. We have discussion questions that go along with it. It could be a huge blessing for you and your church. Yeah, and this would be perfect for tons of different mediums. Maybe you're a pastor uh, who's preaching through the Gospel of Mark, a home group leader, a Sunday school teacher. Uh, this would fit all of your needs. And if you want to pick this up, there's a link in the description for the home group material. In addition to that, maybe you're out there and you don't lead any kind of group like that. Uh, maybe you just want to contribute as a thank you to what we've put together here on Remnant. There's PayPal descriptions in the link of this video if you would like to uh, support us. So absolutely, click those links in the description, hit that subscribe button, and please enjoy this video with Dr. Craig here. Hey everybody, uh, thank you so much for tuning back into this episode. We are going to be covering Mark chapter 3. Uh, it is a uh, it's, it's, it's a great passage. we got stuff like uh, Jesus healing a guy with a withered hand on the Sabbath. We've got a crowd of people following Jesus, massive crowd, demons crying out that you're the Son of God. Uh, we, we've got a story in here where Jesus pulls the 12 disciples together. There's blasphemy of the Spirit. There's people, uh, his mom and dad, no mom and dad, mom and uh, uh, siblings are coming to the house saying he's crazy. I mean, it's a it's, a, it's, a, it's exactly what we'd expect with the mm -hmm. immediateliness of Mark. Uh, Dr. Keener, uh, let's just start in saying, how does, this, how does this flow with the narrative of Mark? What we see just in our last chapter in chapter two, there's some fasting, not fasting conversation, there's some Sabbath conversation. And here in chapter three, there seems to be some Sabbath conversation. Doesn't seem like that chapter was laid out just perfectly. Uh, and then how does it flow into the next chapter? Let's just talk about the, the literary flow before we move forward. Yeah, three, three one to six really follows directly from Oh, I'll have sorry. you pull that in a little bit. Yeah, yeah sorry. There you go. Three, three, one to six really follows the stuff you've got in chapter two. It really mm -hmm. belongs with that. So you've got increasing conflict with the religious leaders and eventually with the political leaders, uh, with, with elites in general. And in, uh, in, in three, one to six, you have that uh, conflict expressed in healing. You're going to have more healings. You're going to have more conflict, uh, both with Jesus' family and with uh, some scribes. You've got the big guns coming in now from Jerusalem, not just these Galilean uh, Pharisees, but you know, ones from Jerusalem, from the headquarters, from the uh, capital. And uh, yeah, he's going to face more and, intense and, and a lot of it yeah. is is over over his miracles. Mm -hmm. And exorcisms. Well, well, let's talk about that first miracle, the healing of the man with the withered hand. Uh, I, I know that Mark likes to, the, the last chapter we saw, the allusions to Daniel chapter 7. Uh, he'll, he'll pull in, sometimes discreetly, uh, an Old Testament allusion. Is there any kind of Old Testament allusion or background for the healing of the man with the withered hand? I don't know if he's thinking of an Old Testament illusion per se, but you do have a healing of a withered hand in uh, in, in the Old Testament where uh, King Jeroboam, son of Nebat, the, the w this wicked king, he stretches out his hand and says, seize him about a prophet, and then his hand withers. And he says, pray for me, man of God. And the man of God prays for him, and his, his withered hand is healed. So uh, there is precedent, certainly, for it in the Old Testament. Okay, could do you think a case could be made for an allusion to that? Or you think that's just completely uh, I mean, I mean there, there could be an illusion, but I think Mark would have included the story either way because of uh, where it's going in terms of the conflict. Okay. So what's with this question about lawfulness? Like where he's like, is it lawful to do good or, <laughs> or to harm or to save a life mm -hmm. or to kill? Like what's, what's, what's with the, the parallelism there? I mean, I'm, obviously it's a rhetorical question because... Uh, the Hillelites, who were the minority school of Pharisees, they allowed prayer for the sick on the Sabbath. Mm. It was the Shamaites, the dominant school at this point. Hillelites became dominant leader, um, who who said, "No, you you shouldn't even pray for the sick on the Sabbath." And and Jesus is saying, "Look, to do good, surely that's allowed on the Sabbath." 
you know, well, this could become a situation ethics that could go anywhere with it, but obviously Jesus isn't taking it anywhere. It's a specific example of, you know, using the Sabbath to do something good. I mean, this is God healing somebody, and people are wanting to nitpick over their theories about, you know, stuff that the Torah doesn't, I mean, the Torah doesn't say you can't pray for somebody. Jesus doesn't even lay hands on the man. <laughs> uh, but then the parallelism to, to uh, save life or to kill, so he's taking it to another level. The irony is he knows what's in these people's hearts. In verse 6, they want to kill him. And, and they, they go and make common cause with Herodians, who were partisans of, of Herod Antipas, who's the governor. You know, and, and can he kill people? Well, yeah, he's going to kill For John sure. the Baptist in chapter 6. So he's spoiler. Alert. He's getting some. Sorry, that's no, okay. <laughs> he's getting. He's building some enemies. You know, but it was inevitable. There's no way that he can come and and reach out to the marginalized and not snub and offend some of the people who are elite mm -hmm. who don't think you should be doing this with the marginalized. I mean, not that everybody who did that they would want to kill, but. Jesus is not your ordinary everybody. He's going to be drawing large crowds because of his healings. And also people are beginning to think maybe he's more than just a, a nice sage. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you see significance in the verse just before that? Is it lawful? He calls the man to come here. Mm -hmm. uh, is Jesus trying to make a scene out of this? Why does he call the man forth? <laughs> well... <sighs> Is this an altar the, call? The, the way, yeah. <laughs> so the way, the way synagogues hand. were built. He's, a, he's about to wave a jacket. I see that, I see that hand. Ju <laughs> Judean, Judean and Galilean synagogues in the first century, as opposed to later centuries, you didn't have the, the Torah arc on the back wall um, like you do in later centuries. In the first century, what you did, it seems like everything was in the center. And so you had rows of benches around mm -hmm. the center. Oh, that's right. So yeah. the one place where the person would be most visible was in the center. And literally in Greek, it says that he calls the man forth in the midst. So he invites the man to come in front of everybody. But Jesus doesn't do anything except tell him to stretch out his hand. There's nothing unlawful about stretching out your hand on the Sabbath. You know, these people have to be really nitpicky. They want to get rid of him, but they can't get rid of him based on biblical law. That's why they go looking for um, some political help. Um, and again, we shouldn't think this was normal Pharisaic behavior, but mm. these Pharisees really have it in for Jesus. Okay, so 7 through 12, we see um, he's continuing his ministry. Tons of people are getting healed. And again, the demons are crying out, the Son of God. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're in chapter 3, and there is a repeating theme where it seems like the demons know who he is, but again, that the thick-headedness of the crowd isn't coming to grips with it. How do we how do we understand that? Uh, again, this is big crowds that are following. All these people are hearing demons cry out that he's the son of God. Are they assuming that the demons are blaspheming? Mm, that's that's a good question. It seems like it's going over people's heads. You know, like well, you don't want to accept demonic testimony anyway, and neither does Jesus. He sure. silences the demons. But but the people. Um, you know, there were a lot of different definitions for being a child of God in, you know, in the Old Testament, just as a, an Israelite, you were a child of God in mm -hmm. a general sense, although that's usually used corporately rather than for each individual. But in Wisdom of Solomon, you know, the righteous is considered a child of God. So they may not be willing to, you know, they, they may overlook it. They may put it off to one side. But Jesus going out to the, to the lakeside is is significant because the synagogues normally the way they were built they could probably only hold like 10 percent of the local population so only certain people get to hear them in the synagogues mm -hmm. and even in the homes you know they can't hold everybody but out by the lakeside a lot of people can come mm -hmm. and there's actually another play on words in greek in this paragraph because you have the the demons falling down before him and then you have people falling on him. It doesn't say they just were trying to touch him, but it literally says they were falling on him. So he's in danger of being squished. People are so desperate he's to get trampled. to him. And he wants, he wants to bless everybody, but you know, there's, there are going to be reasons why he's eventually going to have to push out in the boat. Mm. Uh, 
for acoustic reasons, but also for just safety reasons, safety protocols. And you all want to be celebrities? Uh, yeah, anyway, the yeah. paparazzi are going to be after you. They're never yeah. going to let you alone. Anyway. No fun. <laughs> well, yeah, and I, and I want to build off that question because we've touched on this theme, especially in our in our overview introduction, introduction of Jesus as the Son of God. So Mark, first verse, introduces us to Jesus, Son of God. Mm -hmm. And we talked about that. Now we have this on the in the mouth of a demon mm -hmm. jesus is the son of god we'll see that again later in the mouth of a demon yeah and it's not yeah yeah and then it's not until the end of the book we see it in a centurion mm -hmm. that uh surely this was the son of god and that's sort of a climb that's a climactic moment like now a, a human gets it <laughs> and, 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 and of all humans it's a gentile it's a member of the execution squad i mean it's like the unlikeliest human and and he doesn't he doesn't get to see healings or anything. He just he sees, sees the suffering. He sees Messiah. the way Jesus died. It says, "Amen." Man, that'll preach. Well, so <laughs> what what I want to I just got goosebumps. Uh, <laughs> but what I want to focus on is the fact that the demons are getting it. But in the previous uh, mm -hmm. paragraph, the religious leaders are not getting it. In right. fact. It says uh, that he looked around at them, verse 5, or looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, yep. before he says, stretch out your hand. It seems like this hardness of heart yep. is a theme in the book of Mark. Mm -hmm. Could you expand upon that a little sure. bit? It comes up in chapter 4. Uh, well, it's in the context of the Isaiah 6 passage that's quoted in chapter <clears throat> 4, verses 11 and 12, where... Um, it's because of people's hardness of heart that they're not going to understand the, the um, message of the kingdom. And then in chapter 8, it speaks of the hardness of the heart of Jesus' disciples. You know, he says it like five different ways. Are you still blind? You still not see? Are your heart still so hard? And you have that in the Old Testament sometimes. Uh, but most prominently, you have it in the Exodus narratives where Pharaoh's heart is hardened. Mm. And God hardens Pharaoh's heart. It says, you know, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. And then after a while, it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And it also tells us that God raised up this Pharaoh to show his glory. So God isn't glorified, especially among the powerful, but among the weak and the lowly and the broken. And those of us who are in any sense, religious leaders today, we better watch out because sometimes people say, well, they were Jewish. It has nothing to do with their ethnicity. It has to do with their eliteness. And once the disciples start getting into their heads, well, we're going to be the religious leaders now, they fall into the same traps as the Pharisees and the scribes. Wow. So we who are teaching people in the name of Jesus, we better watch out today because wow. this is a temptation for people Amen. in leadership. Jesus Celebrity gives us the pastors. example of being yeah. servant leaders. Mm, and we talk about servant leaders, great segue into the 12 disciples. Yeah. And it seems as if, if I'm just reading this with natural eyes here, there's a bunch of people crushing him, and he's like, everyone's trying to get to me. Let's let's outsource this. Let, let's get <laughs> some other guys who can be little me's, who can go around and heal the sick and preach the kingdom. So he calls forth 12. Now, again, think being very Western of me, I'm like, just 12? I mean, there's throngs of people out here, these massive crowds that are following. Why not? Why not 30? Why not 60? Why not 100? I could make some jokes about the Zodiac or something, but there you go. No, but, but, <laughs> but the, the 12, um, in, in light of, you know, what Mark quotes actually sometimes in his gospel is the Old Testament. Mm. And so in the Old Testament, the 12, especially is the 12 tribes of Israel. So Jewish people were expecting a restoration. And in places like the Dead Sea Scrolls, actually, it talks about uh, groups with, uh, there, there are 12 leaders, and then there's three either within the 12 or additional to the 12. There's some dispute on that. But they, they had a group of 12 leaders because they believed that they were a restoration movement. They were the, the beginning, the, they were the remnant appropriate on remnant radio appropriate yes. <laughs> they were the Thank remnant of god's people to bring about restoration jesus is choosing representatives 12 representatives 
of this remnant who are going to embody uh, his, his people. Mm. And so you get to the end of the chapter, you've got some of the people who ought to be the ultimate insiders who become the outsiders, and then Jesus' spiritual family uh, who are contrasted with that. I think um, you, you see a theme emerging which has ecclesiological implications or implications for the people of God, um, that it's not, it's not necessarily just what you expect. But you talked about outsourcing. You know, one, one problem with delegating, sometimes, um, you know, you want to get something right, done right, you got to do it yourself. <laughs> when you delegate, you sometimes have to live with some mistakes along the way till they get it. And it's going to take the disciples so long to get it, you're going to find Jesus getting lovingly frustrated at points. Yeah. So pretty similar to the Old Testament and the yeah. 12 tribes. Oh, Again, yes. God appointed them, but still it's like, come on, yeah. guys. Yeah. yeah. Well, Please. <laughs> <laughs> well, so they don't choose him as might have been customary, I understand. He chooses them. I'm yes. interested in the significance of him choosing them, mm -hmm. uh, of him designating them apostles, mm -hmm. and uh, and then appointing them to preach and to cast out demons. Why those two activities? Oh, boy. Now you just asked three questions there. Uh, yeah. so Michael's really good. Wrong. I'm good at that. Wait, I, so he knows he only gets one turn. It's him and then me. And then, oh, him. then if he can sneak three in, he gets to go three yeah. times. So uh, choosing with God's people, we have that in the Old Testament, choosing people for different roles in the Old Testament where God uh, appoints different leaders. So you've got that. Um, you've also got, okay, what was the second of the three uh, <laughs> questions? So... He calls them apostles, okay. appoints them to preach and cast out that, demons. No, the apostles, there's two texts in Mark where he may call them apostles, I think 6.30 and, and one in, in 3.14 or so. But the uh, one of them, there's a textual variant. But in, least, in at least one of the passages, it's actually there. It says apostles. Now, in Luke, when Luke uses the term apostles, he limits it to the 12, except he makes an exception in Acts 14 for debated reasons. Uh, where Paul and Barnabas are both apostles. Paul uses the, the term apostle a lot more broadly, so including himself, Andronicus and Junia, and a bunch of other people. Uh, James, the Lord's brother, Galatians 119, and um, Silas and Timothy, and, and uh, you know, the 12, and then all the apostles, 1 Corinthians 15, 5 to 7. So you have a, a broader definition that Paul uses. But in terms of the, the uh, even the 12, apostle... Well, the big the big thing people always cite is it's apostolos is cognate to the verb apostello to send, and so God sent the prophets in the Old Testament, and they were commissioned representatives, a, a messenger, an agent, a herald, or an ambassador, both in Greek and in Jewish cultures, as a representative of the one that sent them. They carried the authority of the one that sent them to the extent that they accurately represented that that message. Uh, Jewish, Jewish tradition even allowed them to uh, negotiate marriages uh, okay. on behalf of the fathers of the respective uh, parties. So uh, they, they, they carried a lot of authority, but it was delegated authority. So there's that, and then the, oh, and then the particular things that they're commissioned to do. In, in chapter six, that's where we see them actually sent out. So in chapter six, uh, 7 through 13, part of, the, part of what they're sent to do, they're told to go. He, it says Jesus gives them authority over demons. So that's the emphasis. But I think it's in 630 when they come back, they report how they preached, how they healed, uh, anointing the sick with oil, and how they cast out demons. So they were really doing all, all they were really doing three things. But Mark is highlighting, I think, the authority over demons because of this conflict with Satan idea that goes back to 113 with, with Satan and also Jesus' authority over demons. Um, but the devil is also coming behind the scenes through elites, as, as you see throughout the, um, throughout the gospel. But also, there's one thing we left out there because it says Jesus called these 12, first of all, to be with him 
And that's the first thing of discipleship. But there's also a problem that we see later on in the gospel because when the disciples abandon him, they're doing exactly the opposite of what a disciple should do. When Peter denies Jesus and somebody says, you, you were his disciple, you were with him. And Peter says, I am not. Well, ironically, they're both speaking sort of truth because Peter being with him should have meant he was his disciple. And now by denying Jesus, Peter is not following to the cross and not acting like a disciple. It's just, it's interesting. Um, the, the I've heard, and, and this is maybe one of those things that I, I'd kind of want you to settle as far as history, because I hear a lot of guys talk about apostolic ministry. We run in charismatic spaces, and one of the things they say is that you know Rome as a would or Rome or Greece or whatever they would send a person to go and teach culture and change the culture of an area, and they would send an apostle to go and do that. Like, let's go teach the Egyptians our architecture. Let's go teach them whatever. There's nothing in there that has to do with culture or discipleship or anything like that. An apostle is just someone who's sent on the behalf of someone else. It, you seem to make it sound like it had nothing to do with government. And it, like, hey, you could negotiate a marriage between two families yeah. and just be sent. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there were legates, and so if you're an apostle, for the kingdom, I mean, you can be in a sense like an ambassador or something, mm -hmm. but I think that some people are reading too much into stretch. the word. It has to be the context that gives it any kind of meaning like that. So in this next passage, Jesus, they're, they're, they're trying to figure so out how. He's, he's, he's see, I, got, I snuck my second one and you saw that. Okay, I'm glad that you caught it. Uh, he's, you, it was a quick answer, so I got, I got another one. Um, uh, demons here, mm -hmm. right? Casting out demons. He's casting out the demons by the spirit of Beelzebub. Right. And then Jesus is like, whoa, uh, let's not blaspheme the Holy Spirit folk because that doesn't get forgiven. Mm -hmm. well, if there was if there were two verses in all of the Bible that should scare every Christian, it's like blasphemy of the Holy Spirit in John seven or no, John Matthew seven. You know, some okay. are going to say, Lord, Lord, and not get in. Like those are two that like we should all go, OK, listen very carefully. So settle the debate. What's the blasphemy of the spirit? And how do we how do we avoid this? Well, in Mark. They're attribu it, it actually says, uh, he says this to them because they were saying he has an impure or unclean spirit. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in chapter 1 and verse 10, God's spirit comes on him. Mm -hmm. God's spirit equips him, sends him out into the wilderness, uh, throws him out, casts him out into the wilderness. You know, Matthew and Luke, it's very, very more Old Testament, you know, led by the spirit in the wilderness, like Israel was led in the wilderness. But cast him out into the wilderness for conflict with the devil. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, he, so Jesus is the epitome of not unclean spirit. He's the one who's casting out the unclean spirits. And then these, these religious people who are, you know, purists on what should be purity, <laughs> they're the ones who are risking, like, inviting all the spirits back in, in a sense. So that, mm. I'm, I'm drawing on stuff from, from um, Luke 11 and and Matthew 12 mm -hmm, at this mm -hmm. point, but um, but in terms of in terms of uh, I mean in terms of you know the inviting the other spirits back in, but in in Mark uh, three where he speaks of blaspheming the spirit, I don't think the idea is just attributing the works of God to the devil. I think it's being so committed to reject the identity of Jesus that when you see the work of the Spirit, you're willing to say it's the work of the devil so that you can you can reject Jesus. Okay, so I'll, I've got charismatic friends. I'm going to sneak a third one in, dude. I'm sorry. I've got charismatic friends who they see their cessationist brothers picking at some of the services. Someone's falling on the ground. They're shaking or something. And they're like, bro, that's a demon. And then my charismatic friends are going, whoa, 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 be careful. I don't want you to like blaspheme the Spirit. So help us. You, you, you made it sound like that's not blasphemy of the Spirit. I mean, I think is what I heard you say. You would say more like just willful, deliberate rejection of Jesus and the kind of accompanying signs of that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I think the latter is what would be blaspheming of the Spirit in the unforgivable sense. Okay. Um, because a person's heart is so hard, you know, even even direct evidence, miracle happening in front of them is not going to persuade them. I, I, I know a couple atheist friends who... You know, when I was an atheist, I was, I think I was fairly open-minded. I would have believed if I saw a miracle, at least it would have gotten my attention. But I have a couple atheist friends where I've asked them if, 
if somebody were raised from the dead in front of you, would you believe? And they said, no. I'm like, okay, what would persuade them? Mm -hmm. I mean, they've, they've put the bar of evidence so high. And I think they may be in danger mm -hmm. of something like that because if nothing can persuade you, you know, and you're willing to go to those lengths. And for centuries after this, I mean, the detractors of Christianity, when, when Christians would work miracles or when Jesus, you know, people would talk about Jesus working miracles, people didn't try to deny the miracles. They'd attribute them to sorcery mm -hmm. as a way of getting around it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Jesus will follow up that discussion and he'll say, no one can, uh, the, the exact quote, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, then indeed he may plunder his house. So mm -hmm. he he's trying to explain by way of parable what is happening mm -hmm. as he's casting out a demon. Mm -hmm. Can uh, can you can you maybe understand or help us understand what exactly is, who's the strong man? How is he binding this strong man? Is this, in, is this entirely situational? Is it eschatological? Uh, just help us understand Jesus' how, statement. How many questions did he... Did I, he I don't know. But I, they're all nuances of the same question. Uh, what is binding the strong man? Yeah. Oh, there's a, there, see, there's so much to be said in this. But, I mean, there are also some plays and words here that will be relevant on the Markan level, uh, not so much for Jesus' immediate audience in the in this context, but, you know, the, the strong man's house, and uh, he speaks of Satan's household and Satan's kingdom. So we'll come back to Satan's kingdom idea when we get to the legion in chapter 5 and verse 9. Um, God has a kingdom, Satan has a kingdom. Uh, God has a household, Satan has a household. Um, Satan's household, Satan's household is divided. Uh, well, no, he's actually, the point is, it would be stupid for Satan to divide his household by by doing this mass casting out of demons that Jesus is doing. And not like, you know, like um, there were people who were known as exorcists back then who might cast out a demon here or there. Uh, and maybe there was some negotiation within Satan's kingdom. But I mean, Jesus is just driving them out everywhere. And so that wouldn't make sense for Satan to do that. But notice Jesus' own physical household is divided later on in this chapter, um, and, but he's going to give preference to his, his spiritual household. So there, there's some, some other things going on here, very interesting. But in terms of binding the strong man, some of that may go back to language. I think it's Isaiah 45, is it 49? or I forget. It's somewhere, somewhere in, in, in uh, that section of Isaiah where uh, Yahweh binds the, the strong man to, to free his people, to, to take, to, to plunder, take away the, um, and deliver his people. So Jesus is drawing on an Old Testament image. They probably don't catch that one because um, it's, it's not word for word by any means. But um, there, there were a lot of people who spoke of binding and loosing back then. Mm -hmm. It's all over the place in ancient magical texts, binding demons to get them to do their will and so on. But binding and loosing is also a more common image like you want to tie somebody up or you want to set them free and Jesus is the one that John the Baptist says one is coming mightier than I well Jesus is this mighty one who's stronger than the strong man nobody else could bind the strong man you're gonna you're gonna see this fleshed out concretely in chapter 5 with this guy with a legion of demons in him and nobody can bind him not even mm. with chains because he would, he would always break him up. But Jesus is strong enough. Jesus delivers this man. And, and Jesus frees this man from the, the real strong man who's, who's binding him. And, and by plundering Satan's possessions, uh, Beelzebub's possessions, Jesus is freeing, I don't want to say the possessed, because that's a play on words that just works in English, but Basically, the people who were demonized, Jesus is liberating them. Those were Satan's possessions. Mm -hmm. Now he's, he's bringing them into God's kingdom. And the people who are opposing this defeat of Satan are actually working for Satan. And sometimes when people criticize the miracles that God is doing, yes, I'm not saying that they're not saved. 
Mm -hmm. But people who are criticizing things that are really advancing the kingdom may be doing the work of Satan, like like Peter in, in Get behind me, Satan. 8, 833. I mean, so it does happen that people can play into those roles. At the same time, believers in miracles, including myself, we also have to be careful with, like what you said, our cessationist brothers and sisters, yeah. because... Um, just because somebody's wrong on something doesn't mean we write them off as being our brothers Amen. and sisters. Amen. So, I mean, the people who brought me the gospel, this gospel that they brought me was supernatural. I had a radical encounter with the Holy Spirit that converted me. Two days later, I started speaking in tongues. I didn't know what it was because I was converted from atheism. I had mm -hmm. no idea. But the people who brought me that gospel were cessationists. Mm -hmm. But they brought me the true gospel Amen. that contained the spirit in it. Amen. That's it. Yeah. And I think that's such a cool note to, to wrap up on, on this chapter on um, this unique authority that Jesus has. Like before Jesus shows up on the scene, you get David playing a heart and like pacifying demons. But like Jesus shows up and fulfills this promise that there's real war between the seed of the woman and the serpent. And when Jesus shows up, it's like that the kingdom advances against the kingdom of darkness. Now, now you guys squeezed an extra question, so you got to let me do the last paragraph. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the, yeah, mothers, yeah, yeah. yeah the mother and the brothers. Yeah, mothers yeah, and brothers. It's actually, mm -hmm. It actually seems like another one of those Mark and Sandwiches because mm -hmm. he chooses 12 disciples, and then his family thinks he's out of his mind. Mm -hmm. Then there's the blasphemy of the Spirit, and then it comes back to the family, mm -hmm. and Jesus says, well, these disciples are really my mothers and brothers. So, mm -hmm. so what's happening here? And, and, and people who were out of their mind, uh, often it was thought that demonization or, or spirit possession would make people out of their minds. So they're like not uh, as going as far as the the woo. critics, but they're oh, like my already, brother is demon possessed ish, <laughs> thinking something. Yeah, and and wow. but also the wording that's used in Greek there, uh, he's outside himself, which was a way of saying could could mean he was out of his mind, but. Notice that later on, the same wording is used later in the same chapter where they come and they're trying to get into him. And again, he's in a house setting. So, you know, it's crowded and they're they're out in the courtyard and they can't get in. Uh, but they want him to come out to them. And and they're the ones who are out of uh, they're the ones who are standing out. It's the same the same Greek words. Um, <sighs> excess day X. Uh, He's out of his mind. He's standing outside himself. Well, now they're standing outside. <laughs> they're the ones who are really, you know, so it's flipping again. Mm -hmm. and, and Jesus says, who are my brothers and sisters and mother? Those, he looks around at his disciples and, and his other followers, not just the 12, but all the disciples. He says, whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother and that'll come back later in the gospel too and not least when he says to the to the paralytic who, who, who is forgiven in chapter two son your sins are forgiven you mm. or daughter uh your your faith has saved you in 534 wow. or in certainly in chapter 10 where you've left all these other things and uh you'll get more mother of these other brother. things yeah. because you'll spiritual you'll get family. one another yes yeah, spiritual family wow. and and the, the standing outside idea is going to come up again in the next chapter, in chapter 4, where um, he says, for those who are outside, they get everything in parables. But you guys get the explanation. Wow. Say la. Heavy. I love yeah. it. Thank okay. you so much again for, for walking us through this chapter. We've got a lot more chapters to go through. Uh, so thank you guys so much for tuning in through all of this. We really appreciate uh, your viewership and support. And we'll see you in the next one. Blessings. I hope you've enjoyed that episode on the Gospel of Mark with Dr. Craig Keener. If you want to go back and watch former episodes that we've done, there's a playlist right here, uh, or you can watch the very next chapter, which will be listed right here. If you've been blessed by this episode or other episodes we've done, consider giving. There are links in the description.